A few months ago, we put out a video about underappreciated RPGs. Not necessarily underrated, but rather more titles that have either sort of been forgotten about over the years or lesser appreciated entries from more popular series. It was received pretty well, plus there's obviously way more than eight games that could be fitting here, so hey, why not do a part two? Some of these could maybe be considered hidden gems, though they don't necessarily have to be in order to qualify for this list. And so yeah, we're not really trying to find the most obscure games in this genre here, just some RPGs that I think deserve some more love. But that said, one of the games in this video is super obscure that I doubt many of you have heard of. And so, without further ado, let's just get into it. Here's an unranked list of 8 great, underappreciated RPGs that deserve more recognition. Part 2 The light is your guide. The dream is what keeps you going. Alright, to start off this list, we have Legend of Lagaya. Legend of Lagaya was released in 1998 in Japan, 1999 in North America, and 2000 in Europe. It was co-developed by the companies Contrail and Prokeon. Prokeon, I can't seem to find out much about as they don't even have a Wikipedia page and only seem to have a few titles under their belt, whereas Contrail, they were a subsidiary of Sony and oversaw the development of a few other games back then like Alundra 2 and Wild Arms 2. The latter we included in part 1 of the series and is one of my favorite RPGs ever. Anyway, Contrail was absorbed back into Sony and Prokeon doesn't even exist anymore, so yeah. Legend of the Guy was made by some pretty obscure teams which kind of factors into its underappreciatedness. I know this is quite the statement, but had I never played this game, you guys might not be watching this video right now. After games like Super Mario RPG and Pokemon Blue, Legend of the Guy was the first serious RPG I ever played and it got me absolutely hooked. I mean, I was obsessed. I'm talking like renting it five times from Blockbuster, telling all my friends about it, bringing the instruction manual to school, hooking it up on that tiny ass TV in our van to play during my brother's baseball tournaments, and yeah, the whole shebang. With all that said, its spot on this list isn't just due to me being blinded by nostalgia. The game does a lot of unique things that deserve some more recognition, I feel. The most standout feature is definitely the battle system, so let's talk about that. Combat in Legend of Gaia is turn-based, however, it's not your average turn-based system. Essentially, you chain right punches, left punches, high kicks, and low kicks together to create arts, which are like powerful attacks. The number of commands you can chain together only increases as the game goes on, leading to bigger and better arts. Nowadays, I guess you can just look up all the combos online, which kind of takes away some of the fun from discovering them on your own, but still, credit given where it's due. This was a very unique system at the time, and still is now. The only thing that immediately comes to mind is the Deathblow system from Xenogears, and even then, those were handled a little bit differently. What makes the combat even cooler is that your new weapons and armor are actually reflected on your characters. It's more common nowadays for JRPGs to have different outfits and stuff, but back then, this was not the case. It actually kind of set me up for later disappointment when I played other RPGs after this one and was like, oh, I guess their clothes never change, huh? No, yeah, and it goes without saying. The battle graphics here have aged amazingly well, at least the character models. The graphics outside battle are just okay, but man, the battle graphics, these blew my mind as a kid. So good. Anyway, it's not just combat that Legend of Agaia shines in. The music, the story, and the atmosphere are all top notch. I think the OST is super underrated, actually. I'm not really a music guy, so I don't know how to describe it, but it's got a very unique and identifiable to the game sound. Like, you'll just hear a song from the game and be like, oh yeah, that's a Lagaya track. It just fits the atmosphere and feel of the game so well. When it comes to the story, it's definitely a pretty serious and kind of dark one. I mean, shit, one of the first cutscenes you see when a monster attacks your town lets you know this early on. In the world of Lagaya, there's a stuff called mist which is being spread all over the world and essentially turns monsters violent and people into monsters. It's up to you and your party to travel the world, resurrect Genesis trees, and free the land of mist. The whole concept of gradually pacifying the world gives the game this really distinct feel. It's like a little foreboding and ominous when you enter in these new areas, but also hopeful as you know what's about to come. Then, when you finally do reach a Genesis tree and save that part of the land, nah, it's just so satisfying and peaceful. The atmosphere in this game is truly something special. The characters don't get like insane development or anything, but they're all pretty memorable and likable, especially Noah. 
Seeing her naively react to the world around her, given that she was raised by a wolf in the mountains, is pretty funny and charming to watch. Songi is also a great and very charismatic antagonist. I always like rivals that provide a constant threat throughout the game, and it's done really well here. And wait a second, is this dude supposed to be 19? He looks so much older. Definitely going full on anime there with characters looking way older than they actually are. The same thing goes for Noah being 12. I never thought of her as being that young, I always thought she was at least a teen. Anyway, this is a pretty common thing throughout the entire genre, I'm just picking on the guy right now. You know what, I'm just gonna go on record and say it. Out of all the PS1 RPGs that have Legend in the title, like Legend of Mana and The Legend of Dragoon, in my opinion, I think Legend of Legaia is the best one. I know people really like Dragoon, and I do like it as well, but I'm sorry guys, I would take Legaia over it any day. They did actually get a sequel for the PS2 called Legaia 2 Dual Saga, however, it wasn't as popular with fans, myself included. I mean, it's not a bad game, it's just missing a lot of what made the first game so special. One of the main creators of the original didn't even work on it, so yeah, that kind of tells you all you need to know right there. The OST is excellent though, as it does have some Yasunori Matsuda tracks. But that's besides the point, Legend of a Guy is the better game overall. And so, if you haven't checked out this PS1 classic yet, I highly recommend it. Coming up next, we have Lufia 2, Rise of the Sinistrals. Lufia 2 was developed by the company Neverland and was released for the Super Nintendo. Neverland's an out-of-funks company that developed a handful of obscure games and RPGs back in the day, with the Lufia series and the Rune Factory series being their most notable. Out of all the games they developed though, Lufia 2 is perhaps her crowning achievement and magnum opus. Despite the two of its title, it's actually a prequel to the first game, taking place 100 years prior. This means you don't need to play the first game first, and that's probably a good thing as it's just... okay. It's a little old school and kind of feels more like an NES RPG. Luffy 2 on the other hand though, it's an improvement in every conceivable way. While I wouldn't really say the story is anything particularly special and is perhaps even one of the weaker aspects about the game, it's still better than the original, especially in the character department, which are actually quite good. The whole romance subplot, for example, is handled extremely well for its time. The actual story has you playing as Maxim, the descendant of the hero from the first game as he tries to stop the rise of the Sinistrals, which are these godlike beings trying to destroy the world. Yeah, it's fairly standard, but it serves as a nice vehicle to explore character relationships. The real strength of Lufia 2 is in its gameplay. Dungeon exploration plays out more like a game like Link to the Past rather than traditional RPGs from that era. There's a lot of puzzles to solve and tools to use in order to do so. A lot of other RPGs back then just have you walking through basic-ass corridors, so this was a huge defining feature for Luffy 2. Now, you might be thinking, all that puzzle solving could get a little annoying with random encounters, right? Well, luckily the developers recognize this potential issue, so there are no random encounters. Enemies' movement is actually tied to Maxim's movement, which sort of makes avoiding enemies kind of like a puzzle on its own. When it comes to the battles themselves, they're pretty much your standard turn-based affair, however, there are some elements that make it stand out. You got a four-person battle party for one, whereas most other RPGs only offered three back then. And there's also a monster raising system where you can capture monsters to fight alongside you. You can't control them directly, but they can still level up and learn new abilities. It's a really cool system. When you take everything I've said so far and combine it with some great music, you have one incredible RPG. One of the most overlooked ones in this genre, in my opinion. Even in the heavy-hitting RPG library of the Super Nintendo, it's like a top five RPG. RPGs like Chrono Trigger and Final Fantasy VI get a lot of the spotlight and recognition these days, however, a lot of the people that have played Lufia 2 consider it on a similar level. To me personally, I don't know if I'd quite place it on that same tier, but it is like the next notch below. Right there with other classics like Fantasy Star 4 for me. And so yeah, needless to say, if you haven't played this one yet, please do yourself a favor. It did actually get reimagined for the Nintendo DS, however, it plays completely differently. It's like an action RPG, more similar to the East series. It's not bad, just very different. There were also titles for the Game Boy Color and Game Boy Advance, though these were just okay and not really true successors to Luffy 2 like fans were wanting. And to this day, we still patiently wait and probably forever will. The next game we have on our list is Radiator Stories. Radiator Stories was developed by Tri-Ace and was released for the PS2. The company Tri-Ace is definitely most known for the Star Ocean and Valkyrie Profile series. However, Radiator Stories was one of their obscure one-offs that they released between all those. Because of this, it's become pretty forgotten about and overlooked over the years. At the time of its release, it got pretty average reviews, though it seems like it's gained sort of a cult following since then. There's definitely some people out there that consider it one of, if not their favorite RPG on the PS2. If I'm being totally honest, it's not like an absolute top favorite of mine, but I do respect it and think it's a quality RPG. Just because it's not my preferred cup of tea doesn't mean it's not someone else's. 
Then in Rowdyata stories, you play as a knight of Rowdyata, Jack Russell, as he gets caught up in a conflict between humans and non-humans. Sounds pretty basic, right? Well, on the surface, yes, but execution-wise, no. At a certain point in the story, the game branches off into two paths, letting you choose between the side of the humans and the side of the non-humans. This absolutely affects how the rest of the game plays out and what characters you're able to recruit. Which, speaking of, there are near 200 in this game. Yeah, Chrono Cross haters out there making the move to skip to the next game, I know. I gotta respect the ambition, though. They all have their own backstories, schedules to follow throughout the day, and criteria to recruit. That's another thing that makes this game so ambitious. There's a day and night cycle with every character having their own daily routine to follow, and it's just really cool. It took this concept from games like Brave Fencer Musashi and just expanded upon it. The world building in this game was truly ahead of its time. Interacting with the world in general is just great. You can kick like literally anything and everything, which leads to a variety of results. All this combined with a solid music and more humorous tone of the story, and you have a very enjoyable atmosphere and world to exist in. It's genuinely a pretty funny game. With that said, it definitely does still get pretty serious at times. When it comes to the combat, eh, it's fine. It's similar to Star Ocean and Tales games from that era, but maybe not as good. I wouldn't say it's the main selling point of the game. That's more the world and everything you can do in it. Overall, Radiator Stories may be a bit of a divisive title, but there is undoubtedly a lot of ambition and quality here. For the right player, there's a good time to be had. And coming up next, we have Lunar Eternal Blue. Eternal Blue was developed by the company Game Arts and originally came out for the Sega CD. However, that's not the version we're going to be talking about today, as I've only played the PlayStation version. People seem to be pretty split on what version they prefer. The Sega CD version is harder, has random encounters, and sort of has a different atmosphere due to the color palette of the console. Meanwhile, the PS1 version has visible enemies on screen, more vibrant visuals, more animated cutscenes and voice acting. Ruby, did you say something? Ha! Oh, great! Don't tell me you're hearing voices now! I'm sure I heard something. And it expands upon certain parts of the story a little bit. Plus, it came with all these extra goodies in the packaging. I mean, look at this shit. Even the extremely thick and detailed hardbound instruction manual would have been enough, but no. In classic work and designs fashion, they had to go above and beyond. There's a cloth map, Lucy is pendant from the game, these little character standy things, and even the official soundtrack and a making of CD. Super interesting stuff. I always love watching behind the scenes processes. Since I am a producer, I believe I know everything. But many people are involved with the project. Perhaps as many as a hundred people are involved. One difference between ourselves and other companies is that everybody who has their own expertise, such as scenario writing, illustration, music, and producing, got together and participated in the creation of the story itself. Anyway, enough about all that stuff. Let's talk about the actual game. Eternal Blue is a sequel to the first Lunar game and takes place a thousand years after the events of that one. I wouldn't say that you need to play Silver Star first, however, it might make the experience a little more complete. And so, why am I talking about Eternal Blue then? Well, it just seems to not get brought up as much these days. Plus, even back then, it didn't get near as much attention as the first game did. Silver Star Story got remakes for both the GBA and PSP, whereas Eternal Blue did not. So yeah, Eternal Blue just never got the same treatment as the first game had, which is why I think it's fitting for this list. Also, in our video last year about RPGs that capture the spirit of adventure, I talked about Silver Star's story and said I would talk about Eternal Blue at a later date, so here we are. I gotta be honest though, while I do still kind of like the first game better, there are a lot of people that do prefer Eternal Blue. I would say the community seems to be pretty split actually. They're truly both incredible titles, and you can't go wrong with either. There's just so many things to love about Eternal Blue. The colorful environments and catchy music just create a really enjoyable atmosphere. It gives off such a strong charm and sense of adventure. The only other RPG that matches it in this department in my opinion is Grandia, another Game Arts title. By the way, what the hell happened to Game Arts? Their website's still being updated, but they haven't released an original title in like a decade. You guys clearly know how to capture that childlike wonder and adventurous feel. Come on, give us what we want. Anyway, I would say the atmosphere and presentation are definitely some of the stronger aspects about Eternal Blue. The anime cutscenes are nice and really add a lot to the immersion factor. While personally, I didn't enjoy the story and characters quite as much as the first game, they're still pretty good, especially Jean and Ronfar. I like how they both buck traditional stereotypes. Ronfar may be pretty similar to Kyle from the first game personality-wise, but instead of being a warrior, he's a white mage priest. You hardly ever get males in roles like this, especially ones that are sarcastic, perverted gamblers. It's a nice change of pace. And Jean? Well, it's cool to have badass martial arts women that can kick our ass. 
When it comes to protagonist, Hero's an okay hero. Maybe a little generic, but I like his design. And to me, Lucy is no Luna from the first game, though she's pretty cool too. Perhaps the most interesting thing the game does with his characters and story, however, is the epilogue. I'm not going to spoil it, obviously, but after you beat the main game and save the world, there's like a 5-10 to 10 hour epilogue that truly wraps up Hero's journey. You don't need to do this as the world ending threat is gone by that point, but trust me, you're going to want to. Very few JRPGs have ever done this, so it's pretty cool. And to be fair though, a lot of it is just dungeons and battling. It's a pretty big difficulty spike, not going to lie. And people say the Sega CD version is even harder? Shit man, for JRPG standards, I already thought this one was pretty challenging. Speaking of, let's talk about the battle system. Battles are turn-based with a huge emphasis on positioning. Yeah, these are certainly the guys that made Grandy, alright? Where you're at on the battlefield matters a lot in terms of what enemies you can hit and what enemies can hit you. This adds another layer of strategy that most turn-based systems do not have. Other than that though, it's pretty standard. But trust me, that element alone makes a huge difference. Overall, Eternal Blue is just a phenomenal game. The charming world. The lush visuals, the timeless music, the fun gameplay, they all just come together to create an incredible package. Whether you decide to play this game or Silver Star Story or better yet both, I would honestly say experiencing one of them is a must play in the genre. These games are considered absolute classics for good reason. Just whatever you do though, do not play Dragon Song. We like to forget that one even exists, I'm kind of breaking that code here, I'm sorry. It was made by a different team, and no exaggeration here, but it's legit one of, if not the worst, JRPG of all time. So many mechanics actively designed to make the game as unfun as possible. Anyway, enough about that piece of shit the first two games are worth at. And while they're both amazing, out of those two, Eternal Blue definitely deserves some more recognition. Oh yeah, there was also a spin-off called Walking School Lunar, later remade into Magical School Lunar. However, these were never released outside of Japan. If you want to learn more about those titles though, then be sure to check out our video about RPGs that never left Japan. The next game we have on our list is Septera Core, Legacy of the Creator. Yup, this is the super obscure game I was referring to at the beginning of the video. I'm sure some of you have heard of this one, but probably not too many. It was released in 1999 for the PC by the company Valkyrie Studios, and it remains the only game they ever made. The company got disbanded before they could release their next title, Seraphim, which naturally got cancelled. Anyway, my first introduction to Septera Core was being at Target or something when I was a kid and browsing the game section like I usually do, and coming across this dual pack of Septera Core and this other game called Shogo, which kind of looked like this anime mech game from the cover. Septera Core's cover, on the other hand, though, had this cool blue haired girl with a gun and it just gave off major JRPG vibes, specifically Final Fantasy. Of course, I was very intrigued, really by both games actually. And so, I picked up the case, looked at the back, and, nah, eh, Shogo kind of looked like a generic first-person shooter, but Septera Core, my intuition was right. Full-on JRPG. Well, technically it was made by a Western developer, so I know some people are gonna be like, ah, oh, it's not a true JRPG then, but I mean like, come on. If you show the average person a screenshot of this game next to Final Fantasy VII, they wouldn't be able to tell the difference. Anyway, let's talk about what makes Septera Core so unique and memorable. Well, for one, it was a console-style RPG on the PC, which was very rare. There's an overworld map to explore, turn-based battles, and I keep bringing it up, but the closest comparison really is a PS1 Final Fantasy. I mean, hell, there's even an ATB mechanic. So yeah, I think it's safe to say the game was heavily influenced by Final Fantasy VII, especially with the whole diesel punk aesthetic. However, with all that said, it still has some aspects that give it its own identity, one of these being the abundance of voice acting. You call yourselves men? Forget it, Grub. They aren't worth the effort. That's it! Your ass is grass! Not only does every playable character have voice acting, but every NPC does as well. We want better pay! I don't pay you at all, you idiots! Ah. I mean, yeah, it's not like absolutely top tier, but still, for its time, this is extremely impressive. It definitely helps bring the world to life. And on that note, what a unique world it is. It's actually split up into these floating shells rotating around this core, and they all have their own different vibes and atmosphere. 
I've never seen anything quite like it before and it's seriously so cool. If you're one of those people that are big on atmosphere in video games, Septera Core is worth playing just for this reason alone. When it comes to the story, you play as Maya, a junk scavenger from Shell 2. You don't get a lot of female protagonists in the genre, especially back then, so this kind of set it apart. She's also calm, collected, and capable. Just a good character all around. The story itself is also pretty good. Nothing incredibly unique, but still engaging enough. Now, after everything I've said, some of you might be thinking, this game sounds like an absolute classic, how have I never heard of it? Well, it has one major issue, the pacing, specifically battle pacing. There are a lot of battles and they move slow. Honestly, this will be a deal breaker for some. However, if you have the patience to look past that, there's quite the experience to be had here. I mean, it's definitely a little janky and not near as polished as some of the best RPGs from that era, but still, I gotta respect the creativity and ambition. Again, I would say the atmosphere is really the main selling point. The visuals and music are awesome and just transport you back to how it felt playing a computer game in the late 90s and early 2000s, just with the JRPG structure. For the right person, it's just gonna nail that nostalgic itch. Oh, and the best part? You can buy it for like 5 bucks on Steam, it's dirt cheap. So, even if it doesn't end up being your thing really, you're not risking too much trying to find out. If it looks interesting to you, I recommend giving it a go. Coming up next, we have Thousand Arms. Thousand Arms was released in 1999 for the PS1 and had multiple developers work on it. The first two being Toes and Red Entertainment, known back then as Red Company, and the third being a little company you guys may have heard of by the name of Atlas, probably most known for the Snowboard Kids series and absolutely nothing else. And so, right off the bat, I'm going to start this segment off with a pretty weird statement. When it comes to the actual gameplay experience, Thousand Arms is far from one of the best RPGs I've ever played, but it is also by far one of the most memorable. First, let me explain what makes it so memorable. Well, to put it simply, the charm. If I made a top 10 list about charming JRPGs, Thousand Arms would undoubtedly be near the top. From its character designs, to its lighthearted tone, to its awesome music, to its wacky humor, to its anime cutscenes, to its dating simulation elements, it's all just so incredibly charming. It absolutely nails that late 90s anime aesthetic that so many people know and love. While it's definitely more steampunk fantasy rather than traditional fantasy, the whole tone of the game reminds me of a show like Slayers. It gets serious when it needs to, but in between those moments, it's very zany and lighthearted. In fact, due to the abundance of anime cutscenes and voice acting, it almost feels like you're playing an interactive anime. I've never seen such a beautiful place before. This is my first time outside of Boysby. It really embraces those tropes to the fullest extent. For example, there's this one dude who freezes in fear around pretty women and there's this part where you literally have to drag his frozen ass around town until he finally comes to his senses. The game is just full of moments like this. So yeah, super charming all around. I briefly mentioned this earlier, but perhaps the most unique thing about Thousand Arms is the dating simulation aspect. Well, at least for its time. Nowadays, it's pretty common to see this in games like Persona, but back then, not so much. Thousand Arms may have even been the first game ever localized in the West to feature dating simulation elements. In this regard, it was really ahead of its time. Now, is this the most fleshed out or most in-depth system ever? Not really. It pretty much just boils down to correctly answering questions based on which girl you're going out with. But hey, 11 year old me thought it was pretty cool to be able to brag to friends about having a game that lets you kiss chicks, so there's that. The dating does actually factor into the gameplay as well. In Thousand Arms, you play as Mice Triumph, a spirit blacksmith who has the ability to channel spirits into weapons, with the help of a pretty lady of course. The stronger affection you have with a girl, the more powerful your weapons can become. This is also how you learn new spells and skills. When it comes to the actual battle system though, this is probably where the game falls short. While you can have multiple characters in battle, they really just play out one on one. Only the person in your front line actively attacks, whereas the other two in the back just provide occasional support like a buff or a heal or something, but really not even that much. I mean it's not terrible, but I really do think the game could have been better if it had a traditional 3 person battle system. There's just so many awesome characters and it sucks to sideline most of them. At least you can switch out the frontline character whenever, but only out of the 3 you brought to battle. Let's be honest though, battles are not the reason you play Thousand Arms. Instead, its strengths lie in its characters and atmosphere. Everyone in your party is just so likable and charming and they all have memorable designs. The same thing goes for the villain group, the Evil Mecha 5. Well, maybe not likable in a traditional sense, but they are memorable. I love how the manual comes with so many cool art of the characters. The ones with the main cast and unique backgrounds are especially dope. We get a lot of comments asking where the thumbnail for a relaxing RPG music playlist comes from and, well, that's the homie Mice. Such a cozy picture. Anyway, I'm kind of just rambling now, let's wrap this segment up. 
When looking at lists of the top 10 PlayStation RPGs, Thousand Arms is a name you never really see get brought up, and while to be honest with the amazing RPG library of the PlayStation, it is kind of hard to make a case for it, but still, it deserves to get brought up and talked about more. One way or another, the game just makes a lasting impression on you. It may not be an absolute masterpiece, far from it, but more people need to check it out. I'll see you later. The next game we have on our list is Xenoblade Chronicles X. As with every other game in the Xenoblade series, Xenoblade Chronicles X was developed by Monolith Soft and came out for the Wii U. Yeah, the Wii U. You know, that one Nintendo console that a lot of people didn't even know was a console and thought it was just some add-on instead. Ever since the Switch came out, people kind of just tend to pretend this doesn't even exist. However, even though it didn't have the biggest quantity of games, it did have some quality in there. Xenoblade Chronicles X being a great example. To those that aren't familiar with the franchise, Xenoblade Chronicles X is like a spin-off to the Xenoblade series, which is a spiritual successor to the Xeno Saga series, to which that is a spiritual successor to Xenogears. It's also the only game in the franchise to incorporate some ideas from Western RPG philosophy with having you create and customize your main character. And so yeah, basically it's the black sheep of the franchise on Nintendo's worst selling console. It's absolutely no surprise it's gotten overlooked over the years. With all that said, I gotta be honest though, in my opinion, the story in this game kinda sucks. I was not engaged at all and I couldn't even tell you what it's about now to be honest. But here's the thing, none of this matters. You don't play this game for the main story. Instead, you play it for the incredibly jaw-dropping exploration. No exaggeration, Xenoblade Chronicles X might have the most fun exploration I've ever experienced. All the different and diverse areas you can explore are all breathtakingly beautiful, all in their own way. The colors are so lush and vibrant, and the environments are rich with creativity and detail. It's some of the best world design I've ever seen in a video game. It's so cool to just roam around and see all the native wildlife. It truly feels like its own living ecosystem. The immersion is just excellent. Oh yeah, you want to know the best part about the exploration though? You can f fly in this game. At a certain point in the game, you unlock these giant mechs called Skells, and these open up the world like you've never seen before. This allows you to really appreciate the beauty to its fullest extent. You can also see how all the islands connect together, which just makes the world feel like an actual world. Take all this and add some amazing music, and you have some of the best atmosphere in the genre. When it comes to the combat, it's pretty similar to the other games in the Xenoblade series, where it kind of plays out like an MMO, just with some different twists on it. Skell combat does add some different elements, but it's still largely the same. It's not groundbreaking or anything, however, it gets the job done just fine and complements the exploration well, which again is by far the best aspect about this game. If there's one reason you need to play Xenoblade Chronicles X, it is absolutely that. It's a real shame it's just been stranded on the Wii U. It's more than deserving of a Switch port. With that said, with the success of the series since then, there may be hope yet. And the last game we have on our list is Tales of Eternia. Tales of Eternia was developed by the Namco Tales Studio, known back then as the Wolf Team, and was released for the PS1. Now, I'm sure there are two things that a lot of you are probably thinking. One, that case says Tales of Destiny 2, not Tales of Eternia. And two, isn't the Tales series, like, super popular? To address the first point, Tales of Eternia is the actual name, as they only changed it to Tales of Destiny 2 for the North American release. Probably because there was already a Tales of Destiny 1, and they wanted to create familiarity within the series. The main problem with this though is that Namco did actually create a Tales of Destiny 2 later on. This one was released for the PS2 and only came out of Japan, but still, I'm just not a fan of when localizations change the name. It was named what it was for a reason. Anyway, Turnia later got a port to the PSP, keeping its original title this time. However, that version only came out in Europe and Australia, not in North America. And going back to the second point, yes, the Tales series is quite popular, but I feel that Attorney is one of the better entries in the series that hardly ever gets talked about these days. I have a theory as to why. It kind of just came out at like the worst time. It was one of the last RPGs ever released for the PlayStation, which usually never bodes well as a lot of the attention has already shifted to the next generation, and it also came out at the series' lowest point of Western popularity. You see, the actual first game in the Tales series, Tales of Fantasia, did not come out of the West, so Western audiences were first introduced to the series through Tales of Destiny. It also came out pretty early in the console's lifespan, which was good for attracting players. Because of these reasons, it sold pretty well. Over a million units, in fact. However, the series wouldn't really take off in the West until the release of Tales of Symphonia on the GameCube. And, yeah, guess what came smack dab in between these titles? Tales of Eternia. 
So, it was released after Destiny was a shiny new toy, but before Symphony put the series on the map, and it was released near the end of the console's lifespan. Yeah, not a good recipe for success. To no surprise, it didn't sell as well, but it did get good reception. Honestly, I don't think the game gets near enough credit, it really did a lot for the series. It introduced a lot of series staples, too many to name really, and you know the whole dual world concept from Symphonia? Yeah, Eternia did that first. In fact, Symphonia in general used a lot of the same story beats as Eternia, so if you like the story in that one, you'll like it here too. The only aspect I would really say Eternia falls short in is the characters. It's kind of a smaller cast and they're just okay. Their voice acting also isn't great, but hey, what do you expect for the PS1? Oh yeah? Well maybe I'm just that way because of all the trouble that a certain somebody caused. No, oh, yeah, it's also worth noting that the English version cut out all the skits. These help a lot in fleshing out your party, so yeah, not having them here doesn't do the cast any favors. Everything else about the game is pretty excellent though. I mean, come on, just look at it. These visuals are timeless. The sprites are gorgeous and the environments are so colorful. I think it's one of the prettiest looking titles on the system. The music's also pretty good too. In my opinion, I think it's some of Sakuraba's better work in the series. When it comes to combat, this was obviously before the series transitioned into 3D, so battles play out in 2D. However, just because they're 2D doesn't make them any less fun. It's pretty fast and fluid and feels good to control. It's definitely my favorite 2D combat in the series. It's also just my favorite 2D Tales game as a whole. I do still enjoy some of the 3D Tales games better, but it's still like top 5 in the series to me. It seems to be a favorite among the fans that have played it, it's just that not that many people have actually played it. Due to everything I said earlier, it just hasn't been able to reach as big of an audience as most other Tales games. It's a real shame, as it's a real quality game. There's a lot of love for both Tales fans and JRPG fans in general. Here's the hope, and we get a modern port one day. Alright, and that about wraps up this video. Thanks for watching everyone, we hope you enjoyed it. If you did, please either consider hitting that like button or subscribing to the channel if you haven't already. What are some other underappreciated RPGs that you guys think deserve some more recognition? Between this list and the 8 RPGs from the first part, there are still a lot of other games that could fit here, so let us know in the comments below. As always, just want to give a huge thank you to our Patreon supporters, and of course an extra special shout out to our top patrons, Derek Drost, Jesse Spencer, Jump Rock, and Sayino. All of your support and generosity is very much appreciated. Other than that, thanks again for watching everyone and hope you have an awesome day. This is Corbin from Gaming Productions. Until next time. Fat beats, but still no holler pack seats with no problem.